Um, okay, hi everyone. Uh, we will get started. Uh, so this is Pin Yu Chen from IBM Research, and you are now watching the tutorial on adversarial machine learning for good. Um, so I highlighted for good because it serves really serves two purposes. Right? One is to uh, basically discuss uh, how can we make sustainable research in this new area of ad adversarial machine learning. And the other aspect uh, is really to study how we can leverage adversarial machine learning techniques uh, to do something non-adversarial and uh, for social good. So this is the outline uh, of uh, today's uh, tutorial. So first I will walk through some basics, basics to set up the stage uh, in terms of discussing what is adversarial machine learning. And then I will uh, also share some of the recent trends uh, I have been observing uh, uh, for adversarial machine learning. Then we are going to have a deep dive uh, into several topics that I selected, uh, basically uh, built upon adversarial machine techniques uh, to do something for good and non-adversarial. And I think these are like very exciting and uh, uh, promising directions uh, that's worth uh, um, more attention. Uh, and finally, I will make concluding remarks and discussion. So what is adversarial machine learning? Um, so I would like to start uh, by sharing a more uh, general, uh, broader view of uh, adversarial machine learning. So in a broader sense, uh, adversarial machine learning basically means introducing an adversary, uh, most of the time a virtual uh, competitor during machine learning to help you, uh, your machine or your agent learn better. And we have seen a lot of successful cases. In, uh, the one typical example will be generative adversarial neural net where uh, a generator is trying to generate uh, realistic samples uh, while having an adversary component, in this case, a discriminator uh, to uh, be picky about the generation quality. And then they will, uh, through this uh, interactive uh, and, and uh, competitive training, they will reach a state, stable state where we can get an ideal generator uh, compared to the cases without uh, this notion of adversarial training. And on the other hand, we also see uh, some new policies for, uh, for playing high and seek for open AI's environment uh, uh, being learned uh, through this uh, 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 introducing these uh, 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 virtual agents to play high and seek and to enable uh, our re uh, reinforcement learning agents to learn new uh, and uh, non-trivial non policies compared to a single agent learning scenario. Uh, and more broadly, we also care about the uh, uh, robustness in terms of uh, uh, adversarial AI in the sense that we are really uh, talking about how an adversary in a wide uh, or uh, some uh, white hat hacker in a, a house that will actively use today's AI technology to try to compromise and, and make damage to today's machine learning system. So overall, uh, in a broader view, this uh, notion of adversarial machine learning uh, includes understanding model performance in the worst case scenario, as well as improving model performance by, by learning from uh, mistakes or competitions. Uh, but uh, in today's uh, topic, uh, my scope will be narrower, basically focusing on this adversarial AI aspect of adversarial machine learning. Um, and that, that basically will exclude these uh, ad, uh, other applications or other notions of adversarial machine learning, like a generative adversarial neural nets. Okay, so uh, in this adversarial machine learning that we are going to talk about today, this notion of adversarial AI or you know, AI robustness and security, um, we are basically looking into the gap between AI development and deployment. Uh, so as a machine learning researcher, I'm sure you know when we de develop AI, we kind of assume uh, this AI is being grown and, uh, and developed and created in a nice condition, a greenhouse, basically everything uh, is ideal and condition is nice. Uh, uh, data are ID. Uh, there is no uh, distribution shift. Uh, data are well curated and well uh, labeled and so on. Uh, but we, in reality, when we are going to deploy our AI to the real world, uh, we start to see uh, a lot of gaps or a lot of challenges, right? Uh, including uh, dis uh, distribution shift, for example, uh, the difference between training and uh, testing environments or uh, not to mention there could be some real adversaries in the world, uh, in, in the wild that try to disrupt the, the machine learning service and function of the systems we develop. So uh, basically uh, this notion of adversarial machine learning or AI robustness is try to be proactive and uh, to prepare uh, for the worst case uh, scenario or to 
uh, prepare uh, to bridge the gap uh, from uh, developing AI to uh, safely and reliably deploying AI uh, in the real world. Um, so let me give you some motivation why this is a very important topic, right? So as I mentioned, uh, AI technology, nothing prevents from an, a true malicious user or a ad real adversary using AI to gain their leverage. Right. So, so according to a recent Ghana report, right, uh, it, it, it is predicted that 30% of cyber uh, attacks by 2022, which is uh, this year, will involve data poisoning, model theft, or adversarial examples. So uh, different from uh, typical attacks targeting the uh, uh, platforms or targeting like phishing uh, uh, user, uh, user uh, vulnerabilities and so on, these attacks are uh, basically new types of attack that, that are focusing on uh, systems that are using machine learning as part of their service or as part of their components. Um, but, but however, when we uh, do a survey uh, on 28 organizations uh, ranging from small to large uh, organizations, uh, most of the 25 out of 28 actually did not know how to secure their AI systems. So there is again a big gap uh, between what attackers can do to our system versus what uh, we can we know how to protect our system. Um, so why do we care so much about this worst case uh, robustness? And most of the time it is also called adversarial robustness. Uh, so in the high level, right, we really want to prevent um, uh, these manipulations of our deploying machine learning models when uh, uh, to uh, basically prevent attacks that will create the prediction evasive uh, attacks. So there are several uh, levels that we, why this is an important topic, right? So if we are end user, right? So we would like to ensure we build trust uh, between our end users and our, uh, and our offered AI technology. Um, so wherever these uh, users see these uh, adversarial examples ranging from digital uh, to uh, physical spaces like a stop sign uh, with some stickers were being misclassified as a seat limit or some uh, adversarial t-shirt that we designed such that a person wearing on it will evade the detection of a person detector, uh, all the way to like safety related issue, like how can you add a sticker on the road so that the autonomous driving cars will drive to the wrong lane and so on. So these uh, failure examples uh, of our AI technology today, but if we are not able to solve uh, these uh, critical issues, uh, the end users may not trust our technology and, um, and, and this is because uh, uh, these the arrows basically indicate there is an inconsistent decision making and perception between humans and machines. Uh, and not to mention these AI models can also create a lot of misinformation to confuse uh, humans' decision. Right? For example, some uh, fake news or disinformation right, will cause the stock market to panic uh, and we lost a lot of uh, reputation or revenue because of that. Um, and uh, as a model developer, uh, we, we also care about how do we assess the negative impact in a proactive way, right? So before, if we know our AI technology is going to be used in a, a case sensitive and high stakes uh, safety critical tasks, we would like to uh, pay extra attention or be more cautious and, and do more testing uh, before uh, some uh, real attacker comes in place and uh, compromise our system. Uh, and as a hardcore machine learning researcher, right, we will be very curious to know why my model is uh, performing like 99% accurate on the test set that I collected. But how come when, when it comes to, you know, adversarial examples or uh, worst case uh, robustness evaluations, uh, certain we, we observe very significant performance drop. Uh, that means there is uh, also a gap between worst case and average case. Uh, 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 evaluation. So, and, and that also indicates that there could be some limitations in our current way of training our machine learning systems and algorithms. Um, and as a stakeholder, owner, like a CEO, right, you would like to really monitor what uh, possible damages this uh, lacking robustness uh, can harm to your business uh, to prevent loss in revenue and reputation. And I think as a community, we always want to make sure our AI technology is being put and developed in good hands uh, to ensure safe and responsible use of, of our technology. Um, so I would like to provide a holistic view of adversarial robustness. Basically, that this is a basically a, a summarizing slide to show what are the topics people are, are discussing under this uh, machine learning and robustness or machine learning and security. So uh, we can first look at the uh, uh, life cycle of our AI models. Let me change my laser pointer. Uh, 
so we, we can first look at the uh, life cycle of the uh, AI model development. So we can uh, divide this life cycle of an AI system or algorithm into two stages. Uh, the first phase is the training phase. Uh, the second phase is the testing phase. So in the training phase, right, we will collect data and then we will uh, decide what model to train uh, on those data. It could be a decision tree, random forest, all the way to neural networks. Uh, and once uh, this uh, model is fully uh, tuned and trained, uh, we are going to deploy that model as a service. Uh, and, and there are also different modes based on how we deploy the model. So in the testing phase or in the, in the deployment phase, uh, this AI technology can be deployed as a black box. Uh, in this case, it, it, it can, the service could be offered through an API or uh, some uh, prioritary softwares. So the users can use the functions of the model, but the user didn't know what is inside that service. Um, uh, so it, it, it could be a neural net, it could be a decision tree and so on. Um, on the other hand, some um, AI service uh, or technology could be developed or, or, or offered in a white box manner. In this case, everything is transparent uh, to the user. So for example, uh, the hugging phase will provide uh, pre-trained language models and release the architectures and uh, the, the trend weights uh, for the users to use on their own um, uh, tasks. So in this case, uh, everything is transparent to the end user and that will be a white box model in our terminology. So, and this uh, uh, life cycle can be recurrent in the sense that one can uh, deploy a model and collect new data and update the model and training and re redeploy the model. So that will become a recurrent uh, state. So the, uh, looking at this uh, life cycle, right? So uh, we can def then define what the, the attackers can do to intervene uh, our AI life cycle uh, to create vulnerabilities. Uh, and, and that will be corresponding to different uh, uh, adversarial attacks that people are studying today. Uh, so for example, a uh, poisoning attack often assumes the attacker can uh, have the ability to manipulate a subset of the training data. Uh, but uh, the, the attacker uh, usually do not have the knowledge about how you train a model and what model you are used, used uh, uh, to, to train on those poison data. And similarly, backdoor attack is also another way to, uh, to, to, uh, to inject this uh, poison data to the training set, but also does not assume you have the knowledge of the, uh, the models uh, um, uh, that you are going to compromise. Uh, so data poisoning and backdoors, they have similar uh, objectives, uh, but uh, their functions could be different. And we will talk about that uh, later. But these two attacks are basically well-known attacks in. Uh, in, in training phase because the, they are basically a, a, assuming uh, the attacker can have the ability to access the training set and change part of the training set uh, for their own good. Um, on the other hand, evasion attack, also known as adversarial example, right, is a test time attack in a sense that the attacker does not need to know or, or and also don't have the knowledge of the training data and, and cannot change the training data. So the model was already trained and being deployed. Uh, in, the, in this case, the model may or may not be transparent to the, uh, the, the attacker, depending on it's a white box model or not. Uh, however, the attacker does have the uh, interaction of, of the, in terms of the inference, so the attacker can create uh, any random data and uh, pass through the, the target model and observe the output and create uh, the next iteration of uh, uh, perturbations or adversarial examples to achieve its goal. So in this case, the attacker have access to the inference, but not to the uh, model training, nor, nor the training data. Um, there are also uh, more classical um, uh, security uh, related problems being considered in, in this uh, today's AI systems as well. So for example, uh, can I steal uh, a model right, based on this uh, reverse engineering? Um, can I do membership inference to figure out whether a training sample is in the uh, being used in the system or not, or can I steal or recover uh, training data uh, through this reverse engineering of the AI-driven system? Um, and there are also some uh, uh, attacks targeting this integrity in terms of uh, when we deploy uh, AI systems through a third party, how can we ensure that the model is being uh, deployed uh, uh, faithfully and there is no like interruption or intervention of the third party that will change the model that I provided for deployment. So, uh, so there are so many uh, types of uh, adversarial attack being considered in this space. Uh, but our end goal is right, really, really to achieve a holistic adversarial robustness. 
and there are several principles that people have been uh, uh, proposing right to uh, to ensure that we have a sufficient robustness of the AI systems we, that we are developing. Uh, the first uh, property will be model agnostic. So we would like to hope that whatever techniques we are providing uh, will be uh, maximally model agnostic as possible. That means uh, it should work not only on conv convolutional neural nets, but also on recurrent neural network like across different model architectures and so on. Uh, on the other hand, uh, we also want to maximally leverage the domain knowledge, right? So depending on uh, the task and the data modalities, we would like to uh, leverage the domain knowledge to help uh, machines learn better and, uh, and understand what are adversarial examples and not. Uh, and most importantly, uh, from a practical perspective, we always want these uh, um, uh, patches, uh, these uh, um, uh, defenses to be practical in the sense that uh, it, it will uh, uh, improve the robustness of the system, but it will not uh, uh, be harmful or have bring negative impacts to the original utility of the system. So uh, we certainly don't want some method that is very robust, but will will uh, will uh, drop the uh, accuracy of your uh, the system by half. Uh, that in that case, that will not be an ideal uh, defense in many cases. Um, so if you are a software engineer, uh, you probably are familiar with the concept of penetration testing. So most of the time, uh, studying robustness is very similar to this penetration testing. So we create a lot of uh, uh, use cases and sanity checks and, and active testing to ensure uh, the, the system, right, no matter what stage it is in the AI life, life cycle, right, uh, it, no matter it's training, it's testing, it's more uh, and continuous monitoring, we have to ensure uh, the AI system that we are that, that we are monitoring is continuously uh, operated in a safe uh, safe mode and, and, and reliable to use. Um, so under this uh, uh, notion of adversarial robustness, I divided uh, uh, this uh, uh, area into four uh, uh, pillars. Um, and the, the, the first three pillars are probably more well known to the community that is attack, right? So whenever we say attack, we, are, we basically mean how can we find bugs uh, in a given AI system or an AI algorithm. Uh, so it actually relates to uh, in-house sensitivity and reliability test. Uh, to, to, to do a lot of active probing and testing to ensure uh, there are no bugs uh, to be found before we actually deploy the, uh, the model as a, as a service. Um, and when I say defense in this, uh, in this area, it basically means a, a different model hardening uh, techniques that includes how can you detect potential adversarial threats in the system and after detection, how can you mitigate the, the, the threats you identify? And when you are talking about mitigation, uh, a lot of times we would like some plug and play uh, strategies that can kind of add on to a, a problematic system directly uh, to solve this uh, uh, or mitigate these uh, identified threats. Um, so, uh, and verification or also known as a certification is a, a way to provide some uh, quantifiable level of certificate uh, to show uh, the system is uh, being attack proof or hack proof uh, to a certain level. And this could uh, come very handy, especially when there are uh, low regulations like GDPR or uh, some like future AI robustness or security standards that require every AI driven uh, system to pass a certain level of, uh, of a safety test, test or have some uh, level of uh, safety guarantees. In this case, uh, this verification tool can, can provide some certificate that uh, under this specified threat model, uh, no, no attacks uh, can, uh, can, can uh, compromise uh, the, 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 the considered system and so on. Um, the, the, the last uh, application, uh, sorry, the last uh, thing, which is also the focus of today is actually a new applications to AI driven by studying this adversarial robustness. Uh, I, and I also call it a model boosting. Um, and we will cover a lot of uh, interesting applications that actually uh, I find a lot of connections between the studies of adversarial machine learning uh, to these uh, new domains. Um, so if you have any question, uh, you know, feel, uh, you can unmute yourself or you know, uh, uh, leave a message on the chat. So any questions? Okay, then I will proceed. Okay, so as I mentioned, uh, when we are talking about attacking at the virtual machine learning, we basically mean finding failure modes, right? So um, 
a lot of times, although our end goal is to improve the model robustness, uh, but the first thing we actually uh, is uh, are, are doing most of times to uh, to uh, to check how vulnerable or how sensitive uh, the current system is before you start to think about how can you make it more robust. So um, over over the years, people have been developing a lot of uh, uh, techniques to evaluate uh, adversarial robustness by finding these uh, uh, prediction evasive examples, like adversarial examples, and. Uh, and, and depending on whether the the, uh, the target system is available to you or not, a right? white box or a black box, the, the methodologies could back, could vary. But uh, basically, uh, all these attacks are only vary in terms of their objectiveness, and the, the objectiveness is tied with the particular uh, task uh, the model is originally designed uh, uh, to solve. Uh, and these uh, attacks really can range, uh, can uh, and, and can can range from a different uh, uh, have a very wide range of uh, um, uh, uh, applications, ranging from images to text to audio or to graphs and tabular data, uh, and also different kinds of machine learning uh, paradigms like reinforcement learning, you know, convolutional neural nets, uh, recurrent neural nets, transformers, and so on. So uh, basically, whenever there is a new uh, machine learning paradigm. Uh, being proposed, like foundation model, for example, um, we can apply these uh, principles to evaluate the robustness uh, to see whether this new uh, machine learning paradigm uh, is uh, also helps improve robustness or not. Um, so here I'm going to make a few examples uh, to show how these uh, attacks look like. So this is an example of a physical attack uh, that we that we created uh, in the past. Um, oh, okay, so. I think it should be a movie, but it's not uh, showing. Okay, yeah, never mind. So it, it was supposed to be a video. So if you, so you can see when people for people wearing our design adversarial T-shirt, um, when when it is moving uh, in and out of the of, of the screen, uh, most in most of the frames, uh, the the bounding box detecting the person will be uh, uh, diminished. Basically, means that this adversarial pattern will confuse the person identification model. Uh, and, and actually make the uh, uh, and, and make the uh, person invisible uh, to the machine's eye. Um, the other example is we can also do this uh, uh, adversarial example in the multi-modality fashion. So this is a typical example of image captioning. Uh, the original goal is to uh, take an input image and generate some captions describe the contents of a given image. So for example, this is the original image of a stop sign, and you can see. Uh, the generated the captions by a cell VR image captioner will say it's a red uh, it's a red stop sign sitting on the side of a road, um, and on the bottom it, it, it this this is the adversarial image that we created with some small perturbations that are imperceptible to human eyes, and you can see we are able to change the predict the captions of the output to some random uh, sentence like a brown teddy bear lying on top of a bed, but I'm sure to a human eye. There is no brown teddy bear, and there is no no another bed in in this image. And similarly, we can apply this technique to different modalities like text, right? So this is an example of a fake news detector. Uh, so before any modification, the paragraph below will say this is a one hundred percent fake uh, uh, paragraph, and that means you will be detected as a fake news. Uh, however, when we uh, apply a technique called a paraphrasing, try to rephrase uh, either the words or some sentences in a paragraph. And because paraphrasing is supposed to um, maintain the semantic meaning of the, par the paragraph, so you will see you know, by kind of rewriting and, and changing very small amount of words while keeping the original meaning of the paragraph uh, and basically making the, the paragraph more smooth. Uh, it, then the modified paragraph will say it's, it's a 77 percent real uh, a, a real article, you know, predicted by the same fake news detector, which means it can be used to, to detect the uh, uh, to, to evade the detection of a fake news detector. So these are, are these uh, failure modes in both digital and physical space, and that's what basically other result attacks are. Are uh, doing to evaluate how vulnerable or how sensitive uh, the, the the target uh, machine learning systems are. Um, so once uh, so after attack, the next thing is defense, right? Uh, so upon identifying current machine learning systems are lacking robustness, the next thing is how can we strengthen the model robustness? So uh, most of the time, this uh, defense can be divided into two stages, right? The first stage is to detection. So you we take a uh, 
a, a, a pre-trained model and, and, and with some, uh, some amount of uh, uh, testing uh, samples. And then we will detect um, whether uh, this uh, given uh, network or whether give, uh, this, uh, this uh, set of given samples are adversary or not. Is there any like backdoors or Trojans inside the, the neural network you know, provided by uh, a, a user. And if no threats are being detected, you know, okay, we are good to go. Uh, however, if some threats are being detected, then we are uh, going to the next stage, which is the patching stage. How can you design some plugin tools uh, to fix the errors identified by uh, your detectors and return uh, the user with a clean and safe to use uh, a machine learning model? So in my mind, this is this pipeline is very similar to uh, car maintenance, right? So we drive our car to an inspection site, and they will do a, a very complete and road road uh, inspection uh, of our car. And if they identify any issue, they will fix our cars, and eventually wash our cars and return um, our car uh, at the end, uh, so we can drive safely and, uh, and without worrying any issues. So this is basically what defense is doing. Um, the next thing is what the verification is doing. So verification, as I mentioned earlier, is try to provide some uh, provable uh, robustness assessment and quantification of the of the uh, system. Um, and verification is important because there was a time where people proposed many uh, defenses that are non-verifiable or non-certifiable. Uh, and very soon, these uh, these uh, heuristic defenses are broken by more advanced. Uh, attacks and this is really like a cat and mouse game. There are better attacks and better defense and, and better attacks and so on. So uh, then the community decided we should not go into these uh, uh, heuristics too much, right? unless you can uh, formally prove or show uh, your defense actually make the system more robust. And how can you and how can you quantify this improvement or the level of robustness? Is basically what verification is doing. Uh, and this is what uh, this uh, certified robustness is uh, very important. Uh, so uh, in, uh, in most cases, certified defense is giving you some um, quantifiable guarantee that uh, within a certain range that is certifiable, no matter how you change the state of your system, uh, the output of your model will not change, which means uh, your model's uh, output is robust or consistent uh, within this uh, certified domain of a safe region. And most of the time, we are interested in asking, oh, if I made some changes to my model, how will it actually lead to, to improve performance? So this improved performance, a lot of times, are basically vouched or certified by uh, these uh, certification scores. Um, so this is one example that uh, we, we will also talk about in the next slides. But basically, you can use any scores, including uh, the clever scores that we developed in the past to uh, basically uh, apply on the same set of data, uh, but, the two, uh, but, but, two, but two different variants of the models. And then you, so you can see by looking at the scores, whether uh, the, the, the improvements you made, uh, a, a modification you made on the original model is actually making the model uh, more robust or not. And this verification technique, I should mention, is not an easy task. So uh, a lot of times it has to deal with how can we um, simplify or uh, linearize uh, the complicated uh, uh, interactions um, between neural networks, especially these uh, fit for ne neural networks is basically very convoluted in terms of operations. So a lot of times verification tools are, uh, are, are, are basically handling these new architectures like uh, 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 compassionalization, residual block, uh, transformers, and so on to uh, support uh, these uh, new architect uh, new architectures and to provide a more scalable and efficient verification. Um, so um, uh, ma uh, mathematically right, or uh, theoretically, you know, verification can be seen as the lower bound of the true robustness. So let, let's take a classification as an example. So uh, if we take uh, already learned uh, a, a classifier, which means the, the decision boundaries are already fixed. So this uh, dash lines are the decision boundaries uh, of, of a given neural network. And this uh, point is a data sample of an ostrich image, right? So in this case, adversarial examples basically mean um, data samples that are very close to this uh, given sample, but they are actually lying on the other side of the decision boundary. And that will make uh, the, uh, this a similar looking image being classified as uh, some other class labels. 
So uh, in this view, right, geometrically, you can think about uh, the true robustness will be the uh, distance of this given sample to the closest decision uh, boundary. That basically means uh, th that distance basically reflects the minimum effort an attacker needs to pay in order to uh, uh, make the prediction change by pushing uh, the, the sample to, toward uh, the decision boundary. So what verification is doing most of the time, especially local verification, they are trying to find a, a, a radius, a, 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 a basically a, a bow that's centered at the given data sample. And the radius uh, of that bow will be the certified robustness. So one can guarantee, uh, if you're able to certify this green bow, for example, then one can guarantee no matter how the attacker change uh, or perturb the data sample, as long as the perturbed sample still lies in the uh, green bowl, then we the the uh, we can guarantee that the prediction of the model wouldn't change. In this case, uh, this green bowl still lies in the ostrich uh, classification region. So uh, a lot of times, this certified robustness aiming to see how can we maximally fi find the, the maximum bowl that contains the uh, original image but still lies in the same classification region. And you can generalize this notion to different uh, um, uh, thread models depending on what properties you want to certify. So you can certify the robustness to input perturbations or to uh, semantic perturbations uh, like uh, rotation or um, um, changes in colors and so on. Uh, or you can apply this technique to train a, a neural network that is easy, easier to verify. Uh, or, or come up with new certified uh, defenses and so on. Uh, and a lot of times the techniques is really uh, try to relax the uh, uh, the layer-wise uh, propagation of a, a neural network and try to make everything as linear as possible so that uh, the, the the verification can be uh, certified end-to-end -end in the in the easier and more like computationally efficient manner. Uh, we also uh, provided a very uh, interesting and interactive demo to help people understand the uh, how this uh, uh, quantifiable score, in this case the, uh, the clever score, actually maps to the uh, the notion of robustness and consistency with humans' perception. So this is a demo that we created. It's a hypothetical case where uh, a banking company wants to select uh, one uh, handwritten digit classifier uh, as their uh, check deposit app. So in this case, how can we use our clever score to uh, uh, rank the robustness of different uh, candidates and how uh, users will, will and, 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 and we also have some interactions to check whether the users will agree with the, uh, the, the, the clever scores that we provided for these different candidates. Okay, so this is, will be a, a short, a, a basic introduction to adversarial robustness. And if I, you are interested to, uh, to know more, there are a lot of uh, online resources uh, available, uh, uh, including me. Like, like uh, in recently, I, I gave a, a, like a two hour uh, tutorial at the machine learning summer school and all the videos are made available online. So if you want to know more details about these topics about adversarial robustness. Uh, and there are a lot of uh, toolkits available online to, to, uh, he, uh, to have a quick start uh, for your own project. For example, uh, Clever Hands or IBM's Adversarial Robustness Toolbox uh, or Foolbox. These are like well-known and well-maintained uh, toolkits. Um, there are also some uh, sample survey papers uh, to help you uh, uh, quickly understand, grasp the idea and uh, kind of understand what people are working on in this field. Um, and including uh, me and, and Si Jia Liu also uh, uh, wrote a, a, a survey paper recently and uh, Professor uh, Xiu Rui Xie and I will be publishing a book on adversarial robustness for machine learning at the end of this year. Okay, so any question before I move to the next section? Uh, I, I'll start, uh, I'll keep moving. Um, so next I'm going to share some like my personal uh, thoughts and observations, you know, uh, by looking at the, this uh, growth and uh, excitement of adversarial machine learning over the years, right? So this is a, a, a list of uh, uh, submissions on archive related to adversarial robustness uh, collect, collected by Nicolas uh, Carnini, which is a well-known researcher in this field, right? So. Uh, we do see like an exponential growth uh, of, of this, this domain, right? In terms of, I think the, 
uh, the, the, the first few papers started in, in around the year of 2012 or 2014, and then we see like uh, exponential growth over the years. And because of all the trustworthy AI uh, 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 focus, and also because this is a really important topic that everybody agrees, we had to uh, put more uh, attention and efforts to solve. Uh, but I think now, now uh, since we are 2022 right now, I think it's uh, now it's worth that we uh, pause here and really think deep about uh, what we should we uh, achieve or what should we do, especially for young researchers who just enter this field, right? Uh, about other virtual machine learning, right? So, my my personal observation is that uh, uh, a lot of uh, uh, um, research kind of iterate upon uh, this uh, this this uh, trend. For example, in attack, I observe. There will be papers, you know, have like uh, adversarial attack on a new task, or and then black box adversarial attack on a new task, or uh, and then we make it hard label black box attack on, on on the same task, uh, uh, or we can say, okay, can if I change a different uh, perturbation norm, different threat model, how can we do the attack more efficiently? So these are like a very iterative and uh, 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 papers, and, and I, I do that very often. Uh, uh, and that, let's also see that uh, um, defense, right? So for defense, we kind of see the same trend. Right? Uh, how can we defend uh, against adversarial attack using a new method? And how can we detect an uh, adversarial example using a new method? And then certify the robustness for a certain task or under a certain norm, or how can we improve adversarial training uh, with a certain technique? Uh, and then there are a lot of uh, uh, papers that like that fit into the category of a reflection paper, right? Like all the empirical defenses are vulnerable and I can break uh, those defenses. Um, or we are talking about how, what's the limitation of the threat model? Is it, is it realistic uh, to the real world? Or uh, when there, when there, whenever there is a new a neural network architecture being proposed, right? What is the robustness property? Uh, or more generally, uh, how is the trade-off between adversarial robustness and other uh, related model factors like private privacy, fairness, interpretability, uh, and, and and more theoretically, uh, how can we quantify the hardness of adversarial machine learning from either optimization or generalization perspectives? So I, I think this list I provided will cover at least ninety percent of the uh, papers or research directions that we are being observing today. Right, but I, I think now it's time to really think: is that a sustainable? Uh, 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 direction that we would like to pursue as a community, especially uh, from the angle of how can we uh, continue this exponential growth of this uh, a new and interesting uh, research area uh, at virtual machine learning. Um, so just uh, to give you some incentive, like why we should, you know, really think outside of the box and probably, you know, uh, not to, uh, not to uh, not not to follow this uh, uh, the the trend I described before. Uh, uh, so this is a checklist I created. Like, should I publish my defense against adversarial examples? Uh, and this is latest version, right? So we, we start from here, right? So the first thing that uh, a PK reviewer will ask you is, oh, did you test on PGD white bus attack? You know, if you didn't even test on white bus attack, you know, don't don't ever publish it. And if yes, then do you test on auto attack? So this is an ensemble of uh, uh, the strongest white bus attacks so far. Uh, if not, you know, don't not, not worth publishing it. Uh, and if you if, if you show robustness to an auto attack, right? Do, does, do you observe any sign of grading obfuscation? So this is uh, some phenomenon that happens in some defense, like the you basically make the gradient information useless and. Uh, can can show robustness, but it's actually not a true robustness in the sense that um, uh, if you somehow resolve this grading application problem, the, the system can be as vulnerable as a typical uh, uh, machine learning model. And if you show your model didn't have that uh, uh, issue, right? Then the next question the review will ask you is: uh, Is your model provably robust? Can you prove your model is robust? Uh, if yes, uh, then you, you will say, can you outperform randomized smoothing, which is one of the uh, most uh, uh, strongest uh, certified defense we have so far, right? And then, and then if you are saying no to uh, either of the stage, then you know, um, don't I don't encourage to publish. Uh, and then finally, if you're able to outperform randomized smoothing, the next question will say, oh, do you uh, did you have a notice any drop in clean accuracy? You know, if, if the drop is too significant, then it's not practical and not worth publishing. 
Uh, but if you say no, right, there is no free lunch, right? It's very difficult to improve your model robustness while not sacrificing other factors. So again, you know, probably no free lunch and don't publish. So it's, it looks like a dead end. So it could be a little bit pessimistic, but I just want to mention we are nowadays putting very high bar uh, in terms of the defense papers, right? Because people are really uh, expecting uh, ideal defense uh, to come up and, and being proposed. But uh, in, in practice, uh, you know, defense is very challenging compared to attack. You have to defend any possible uh, outcomes uh, at, for, for attacks. All you need to do is to find one instance that validate, that uh, violates uh, the assumption of the, of the defense to claim successful attack. Okay, so now the interesting question to ask is, right, other than attack and defense right, and verification, right, can we actually leverage uh, the lessons we learned from adversarial machine learning uh, to do something non adversarial and useful to general machine learning research. Uh, and I think this is uh, actually a very uh, doable and viable app option because while uh, we are studying adversarial machine learning to understand the, the limitation and vulnerability of the machine learning system, uh, in many ways, we are actually already uh, gain more insights into how can we control uh, or uh, modify the behaviors of the machinery models, right? So if we, we already kind of know the rule of, of, of the thumb of how to do that, right, then why, can we, uh, why can't we you know, repurpose uh, that uh, uh, techniques to do something totally different and uh, probably more beneficial to the uh, machinery research community? Um, so that brings to the, uh, today's uh, focus for adversarial machine learning for good. Uh, so I will be uh, sharing a lot of applications that I found very interesting uh, uh, over the years. And I will put the specific focus on model reprogramming because I think this is really a nice technology and it has a very tight angle to uh, adversarial machine learning. So for, and also for every application, right, I will, I will make the connection between adversarial machine learning and the application, right, clear so people can know, especially from uh, adversarial machine learning community, you will know, oh, the same technique can be used in a totally different way. Uh, so that, that's, that's, a, that's the goal of the, uh, today's uh, tutorial. So let me start by introducing what is model reprogramming. So this is a, a fairly very new concept. Um, so the idea is how can we reprogram, basically reuse uh, a, a pre-trained model in a domain uh, to solve uh, problems and challenges in the other domain. Um, so the idea is to take a pre-trained model from an other domain and make it frozen, basically uh, don't change the model weights and so on, and insert two uh, new layers, right? Uh, the input transformation there and output mapping there. And I, I will describe more in, in, in details. So by, by inserting these two layers, we are able to reprogram the pre-trained model from one domain to solve problems in an other domain. And here are some examples like reprogram a speech model to do time series uh, learning, and then reprogram language models to do molecule learning, uh, reprogram visual models to do biomedical measurements. Uh, and there are a lot of uh, excitement about model reprogramming. And I think it also uh, echoes very well to uh, the invited talk by um, um, Professor Andrew Ng, right? So he, he was uh, recently mentioning this uh, data centric AI in terms of. Uh, what happens if we only have 50 samples and want to do a good machine learning, how can we enable that in a data-centric manner? So in this case, I believe model reprogramming can come very handy in the sense that uh, because the model reprogramming also inserts these two layers into the, the entire model pipeline, the number of trainable parameters is actually much less compared to you know, training a model from scratch. Uh, so it is also particularly suitable for uh, small data regimes, right? So in terms of the data scale, you know, uh, foundation models or transfer learning or, you know, training from scratch will require a maximum, a lot more number of trainable parameters as well as a lot more training data. But because of model reprogramming and because of the, the reuse of a already well-behaving uh, pre-trained model, um, the data efficiency um, uh, and, and training efficiency of model reprogramming can actually uh, be better, especially in this uh, um, small data or data centric regimes. Uh, and I recently also put a survey paper on this topic. So if you're interested, you know, feel free to check it out. Okay, so as I mentioned, the reason we want to study model reprogramming is that we know 
for the fact that we we have a, a lot of uh, pre-trained models in these data rich domains right so uh, it, uh it make an analogy that will be you know if i have seen further it is by standing on the shoulder of giants right so we, we don't we certainly don't want to reinvent the, the wheels right so the in this case the giants will be the pre-trained models available in some domains the interesting question is how can we maximally leverage those uh, pre-trained models uh, and also expand the model's uh, capacity to other domains, right? So in data-rich domains, we I mean basically uh, computer vision uh, um, languages or speech, we have abundant data to train and we, we do see a lot of excitement and advancement uh, brought by these large pre-trained models right? like uh, GBD3 uh, and a, a lot of uh, uh, state-of-the-art speech models or language models and uh, like vision transformers and so on. So the idea of the model reprogramming is how can we you know, reuse these pre-trained models in this well study domain uh, to solve tasks in re resource limited domains. And when I say resource limited domains, there are several factors. So for example, the number of data in the uh, in the target domain is limited or the, the model development cost right, in terms of the uh, the budget to train a, a model is limited um, so that that also that both fits into the resource limited scenarios um so uh, uh, another way to think about uh, model reprogramming is to think about it as a way a very new way and a powerful alternative to do data efficient transfer learning without fine tuning the model. So that differentiates uh, model reprogramming from uh, transfer learning. And I will talk more about that in the later slides. Um, so uh, before that, I would like to uh, uh, take a detour right, of, uh, and put some focus on foundation models, right? So uh, in, in the past two years, there are a lot of excitement about uh, foundation models right, because we believe that that could lead to at least a one for all solution for AI, right? So, uh, you know, and, and that really uh, affects the machine learning trend in terms of you know training a task specific specific model to you know train a high capacity model pre-train uh, and learn general representations and then fine tune on a specific task uh, uh, and that that kind of notion. So we can really, if we are, have the ability to train a general purpose uh, general representations of a modality through a foundation model, so a lot of times using self-supervised learning or contrastive learning, then uh, we, that general representation can be efficiently fine-tuned on, 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 on downstream tasks with the specific labels and so on. So that's the, the, the promise and, uh, and also the, uh, the, the uh, core technology of uh, foundation models. Uh, but however, we also need, want to uh, also need to note that you know, developing a foundational model is a very costly process. Right? Let's take uh, you know, GBD3 as an example, right? So you, it is trained on about 1,000 billion tokens. And, and that GBD3 model has the 1, 000, uh, 175 billion training parameters. Uh, so the, the memory size of that entire uh, the model is already gigantic. And if you trend on, uh, on, on a cloud, the estimated cost could be like $12 million uh, to trend. So it, it is certainly a, a lot of investment uh, to obtain a state of the art uh, language model like GBD3, right? But interesting question is uh, having invested uh, so much on these uh, uh, big foundational models, right? How can we maximally reuse those models you know, to, to, to do other things uh, so that we don't need to re reinvent the wheels and can, can build up on this uh, nice representation uh, learning of the foundational model to, to do something else. So uh, model reprogramming, right, uh, can be, can actually can be well motivated by re uh, reusing foundational models, right, to solve uh, new tasks. Um, so uh, in, in a way, right, it, it actually, the, the, there's a difference between how we train models in, in a standard fashion versus how we train model in a resource limited fashion, right? So uh, in a standard setting, right, we, we can use foundational model as is by, you know, pre-training plus fine tuning uh, assuming we have sufficient uh, pre-training data and compute power, uh, and, and after we obtain that foundational model, we can fine-tune that model to some in-domain downstream tasks, like a pre-trained uh, masked language model on English corpora and apply that model to different downstream tasks like question answering, uh, parsing, and so on. Uh, how, on the other hand, for the resource-limited setting, right, 
uh, we would like to prefer to do pre reprogramming without uh, fine tuning. And the reason is that in those uh, resource limited domains, uh, there there usually will do, do, do not exist any available foundational model to use. And also because uh, the the data that we can collect we can collect is pretty limited. And and, and also it could be that uh, the uh, for model development, we don't have sufficient compute power to, uh, or like a million dollars to train such a, a big model. Um, so, so the focus is really different when we are talking about resource limited setting compared to standard setting. Um, I also want to differentiate transfer learning uh, from model reprogramming. So for transfer learning, we also obtain a model from a source domain, uh, but what we do for transfer learning is to fine tune a subset of uh, parameters uh, of, of the pre-trained model on the on the on, on the target task, uh, but the, it's always a challenging problem in terms of when you have a limited data on a target task, like which subset of uh, 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 parameters that you should fine tune. So uh, it's always a, a non-trivial non problem. Uh, but on the other hand, model reprogramming did not change the uh, the model weights at all, so it, it will it will avoid this uh, uh, fine tuning subset selection problem. Um, so, so in, so that in contrast, right, the, the model reprogramming is really focusing on cross domain learning uh, by uh, has the ability to reprogram a, a pre-trained model from domain A to solve a, a, another task in domain B. Uh, and it will feature uh, data and compute efficiency, and I will make some examples later. Um, so uh, before I go to the, uh, the the main techniques, I also want to give some highlight, like make connection to other virtual machine learning. So this model reprogramming, interestingly, was actually first proposed uh, through the angle of uh, adversarial reprogramming. Uh, the, the authors actually showed that uh, we, uh, uh, we can reprogram a model to do something else uh, without uh, the noticing the, uh, the, the, the model designer or model developer. So for example, uh, the authors show we can reprogram a pre-trained image learning model to do MNIST classification or CIFAR classification or to do image counting. Uh, and they were concerned about some potential attacks that will reprogram a target model uh, to do some specific task chosen by the attacker without uh, letting the, the model developer know. So that's kind of the adversarial angle of it. Uh, but later on, uh, our pre uh, our work actually show uh, this this uh, angle right can be uh, can be tweaked uh, if we look at things differently by looking at how uh, uh, how uh, reprogramming a machine learning model can bring good uh, to these resource limited settings um, and and so I was I will describe our first work that's called the blah 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 adversarial uh, reprogramming um, so the idea uh, is uh, actually uh, pretty interesting right so. If we assume these uh, black box models uh, could be the, this uh, powerful uh, machine learning based APIs, uh, if we are able to reprogram those APIs uh, to do uh, a machine learning in this data limited setting, so for example, reprogram these general image APIs to do uh, medical imaging classifications where these labeling uh, and, and number of data are actually pretty limited, right? Then can we actually uh, outperform? Uh, the state of the art performance on these challenging tasks. So it, I, I'm, I'm going to use this uh, um, uh, reprogramming example for images to show how in general uh, re reprogramming works. Right? So we start by uh, having a pre-trained model. Right? So in this case, it, it is a uh, image net, uh, it is a model pre-trained on image net. And this model could it be a white box uh, model or a black box model that will uh, give you a prediction of the image net uh, class labels. Uh, then what we do is we look at the target domain, right? Try to what were the domains that we try to reprogram the model to solve, and we basically will put the uh, target domain image at the center uh, of the of 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 the of the reprogrammed image, right? So and so this uh, gray image will be the size of the input to the uh, image net. So we will first put the target data at the center of this uh, uh, big image and then allow some space uh, to be trainable parameters. And, and these trainable parameters could be as simple as just some additive trainable parameters, or it can be a small neural network if, uh, if you want. Uh, and that basically constitutes the, the notion of input transformation layer. So this layer will take the original target domain uh, sample and do some transformation, in this case, some additive 
uh, trainable bias uh, to the data input. And then uh, with this uh, transform input, it will be passed through the, uh, the same pre-trained ImageNet model. So what, what the model will be outputting is, of course, the uh, ImageNet uh, class uh, label predictions. So the next step will be uh, to map the uh, ImageNet class predictions to the target domains class uh, prediction. So uh, you can specify a label mapping function by saying um, the prediction of the uh, target task, in this case, autism spectrum disorder, right, will be the average prediction probability of the, these three classes. And similarly, the num ASD class will be the, the uh, average prediction of the other set of uh, uh, labels. So uh, in this case, we, we actually completed a four pass of the uh, reprogrammed model, right? Through this uh, input transformation layer, as well as the output mapping layer. So what is remaining is uh, we need to update the parameters of the, of the input transformation layer. Basically, these are the additive noises that are being shown here. These are like trainable parameters. Uh, so you need to train those trainable parameters to minimize the loss on the target task. And these uh, models, right, uh, be, depending on what assumption of your model is, if it's a white box model, you can just use back propagation. If it's a black box model, you can actually apply a lot of these uh, black box attack techniques with the zero sort of optimization, for example, uh, to update the parameters by only looking at the function outputs uh, of, 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 the, of the model you are going to reprogram. So in this way, we, we also enable the back propagation loop of the model to enable uh, training, reprogramming a model uh, uh, to do something else without changing the model weights at all. Um, any question before I show some examples? Good. Um, so Next, I'm going to show some three examples of, uh, from model reprogramming. And these are like successful examples that actually outperform state of the art uh, on specific tasks. So the first example is the autism spectrum disorder that we just uh, saw, right? So it's actually uh, a, a brain uh, cor a regional correlation graph um, taken uh, by these fMRI measurements. So what we did is we reprogram uh, ImageNet model uh, to solve this uh, autism spectrum disorder uh, classification task. Uh, and so the first the two methods that you are seeing is the AR, which means the white box reprogramming, and BAR means black box uh, reprogramming. And we also compare to other base dynamic training uh, the same architecture from scratch or you know, transfer learning. So in this case, you can see uh, none of these uh, methods works great, right? Because it, it, it's a binary classification problem and these two methods only give you like uh, random guessing type of accuracy. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, when you reprogram uh, either ResNet or Inception Net, you get uh, some accuracies like, uh, like close to 70. And that accuracy is already outperforming uh, state-of-the-art methods using like sophisticated uh, hand-designed uh, um, um, features or you know, a lot of augmentations. And we simply, uh, when we simply use reprogramming, we actually get a, a state of the art performance on this challenging ASD classification task. So you can, we do see that reprogramming is actually performing better than transfer learning uh, and, and can achieve state of the art uh, and can even reprogram a black box model uh, to, to, to do that without knowing the details of the models. Um, so to show uh, this uh, black box reprogramming, um, technique, we actually actually uh, reprogram a Microsoft Custom Vision API's model. So this API will allow you to up, upload a data set and then they will return a, a black box uh, access to the models they train on their side. But as a user, you wouldn't know what is the model being trained. Uh, so in this case, we are able to um, use this uh, black box uh, reprogramming techniques to reprogram the uh, traffic sign classification model uh, provided by Microsoft class, uh, Custom Vision API to do this uh, ASD classification. So you can see that if you pay the cost of roughly $20, uh, you can get a high accurate uh, ASD classifiers. So this is, this, this is to show um, this uh, reprogramming technique is not only data efficient, it's also um, cost efficient. Uh, the next example is the uh, reprogramming human voice model to um, time series classification. Mm -hmm. So again, this is the case where we, we uh, for speech, we have an abundant data to train large models and, and do a, well, good, a very good uh, pre-training. So 
the pre-trained model we are considering is some uh, that will take some speech uh, inputs and then going through this pre-trained acoustic model and then you will output some voice command prediction. Uh, and, and, and because this time series will uh, be, are basically have a very similar format as a speech, right? You can think of it as uh, some one dimensional um, temporal signals. So what you can, we can do is the very similar to, uh, as the framework of model reprogramming, we uh, keep the, uh, the pre-trained acoustic model frozen and then we insert the reprogram input the transformation layer and the output mapping layer. Uh, and again, here we consider you know, adding some trainable bias uh, to a reprogrammed uh, a target uh, time, time series input. And, and basically we can insert these two layers to, uh, uh, to, to different types of acoustic models uh, like a, a transformer or a unit uh, and uh, while only training these two, two specified uh, um, uh, layers as some trainable parameters. Uh, by doing so, uh, we, we actually show uh, on this uh, um, time, uh, on a, on a, uh, widely used uh, time series benchmark. Uh, this uh, voice to series reprogramming actually outperforms state of the art on 19 out of 30 uh, time series data sets. So, this is a very encouraging news in the sense that uh, we sort of enable this one for all uh, uh, rule uh, to apply. Uh, a well, a well trained, a pre trained model in in the, in, the, in the speech domain to solve uh, time series problems uh, within this uh, data limited scenario. Um, finally, the last example is how to reprogram language models uh, for uh, molecule learning. So um, molecules right, can be represented as a, a string of uh, molecular um, uh, uh, characters. So in that sense, uh, right there is a natural similarity between like uh, uh, our spoken language like English versus the most molecules. So what we did is uh, we actually uh, applied this reprogramming by uh, trying to uh, use the uh, embeddings from English to represent the embeddings of the molecule tokens that we are going to uh, we are going to solve then uh, through this dictionary learning procedure. And once we are able to represent uh, a, a token embedding of molecule as a, as a some linear combination um, of, of the English vocabularies, we can reprogram a sentence classifier uh, to do toxicity prediction for uh, antimicrobial peptides. Uh, and again, even in this uh, limited data setting, uh, we can achieve high accuracy uh, compared to the, the, the best known classifier. Okay, so uh, finally, I would like to also provide some justification on why model reprogramming works. So uh, intuitively, you would, you would expect model reprogramming is doing some knowledge transfer between the original domain to the target domain. But however, that does not explain why this cross domain can be so successful. And, and there could be very little you know, knowledge should be actually being shared between spoken language versus molecules. So in, in our uh, recent ICML paper, we actually prove a theory to show uh, model reprogramming's performance, right? The, the risk, uh, the, the training loss on the target risk uh, task is actually bounded by two terms, the performance of the, the pre-trained model on the source task. So basically uh, a, a, a better performing source model will give you a better reprogramming performance as well as a, a representation alignment loss, right? So intuitively, um, if you can, if we are going to solve a cat versus dog classification problem uh, using a pre-trained model, if I can align the dog representations to a, a specific class of the original task and, and also align the cat uh, representations to an other class of the original task, then after alignment, we can, we can just use the original model's uh, classification uh, to to do this uh, dog versus cat classification. So that's the intuition that like as long as we can re, uh, align the target domain's representation perfectly to the source domain uh, uh, representations, then we can reuse the um, classification rules of the source domain task uh, to, to solve the, the task on the target domain. And this is exactly what we observe in, in practice, right? So. Uh, when we are so this is the v2s uh, example the voice to series example so when we are training the uh, the v2s reprogramming over epochs so when the loss is decreasing and the accuracy is increasing right we actually compare 
the, the Washington distance, which is the, some major of a distributional difference between the source and the, the reprogrammed uh, the target data. So looking at their uh, representations distance, we actually observe while the, the reprogramming becomes more successful, the, the, uh, the alignment loss, right, the distance between the source representation and the target uh, representation actually uh, decreases as well, which is the indication of uh, uh, model reprogramming is actually uh, focusing on aligning the representations rather than uh, some implicit knowledge transfer. Um, so these are some TSMI plot to help you understand the concepts, right? So before model reprogramming, uh, the representations are cannot separate these are two different classes. And if you compare to transfer learning, you see some degree of separation, but not it's still very noisy. But uh, if you use reprogramming, you can see a very nice clustered and separable representations. And that basically indicates uh, why reprogramming can give you high accuracy on the, on, on the uh, target task. Um, so as I promised, the, the, this reprogramming can actually make, make connection to uh, not just adversarial reprogramming, but also backdoor attacks, right? So if you are familiar with how backdoor attack works, right? So the backdoor attack will first uh, uh, manipulate, uh, basically uh, poison some subset of data samples with some predefined trigger pattern, these uh, 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 white uh, squares. And, and we, you will label any images in the training set with that uh, pattern as uh, some specific label, in this case, label four. And then uh, you will use that uh, poison data to train your own model. So because of the memorization effect, right, when the model sees the trigger pattern, you will say it's a label for rather than the actual contents. However, without this uh, trigger pattern, uh, the model will behave just like a regular model. And that's why this is a, called a Trojan or backdoor attack, because the attack will only be effective when the trigger pattern is present. Right, so no, so basically, uh, this uh, a backdoor attack shows that the models uh, can be malleable and, and, and memorizing some uh, specific patterns and to change the behavior uh, of, of that model, or and basically, you know, adding adding a, a adding a, some trojan like some hidden behavior other than doing a normal task. So similarly, if you think about model reprogramming as a way to uh, learn some trainable triggers at the data input, right? So that we can uh, basically add a new function, right? Or uh, hide some like, good backdoor uh, functions uh, in the pre-trained model to enable a new function. So that would be the way I would like to think about the, the connection between model reprogramming and backdoor attack. Um, any question before I move to the next application? Okay, so the next uh, uh, topic is uh, contrastive explanation and counterfactual examples. So let me use this uh, uh, interesting case to illustrate what is contrastive explanation, right? So I believe many of you have more than one friend that uh, is named Steve, right? So if you want to specify which specific Steve you are talking about, you will say, oh, I'm talking about a Steve who is a tall guy with long hair, but does not wear glasses. So the feature that the missing feature that this does not wear glasses is actually very important to identify which Steve you are talking about. And translating to um, explanations, right? There are actually some formal terms to describe these behaviors, right? So, for example, um, pertinent positives uh, in criminology basically means these are like minimally sufficient evidence to be uh, present to support original classification. Uh, on the other hand, pertinent negatives, right, which is related to this does not wear glass notion, right, it's actually necessary absent uh, to prevent changing the classification of the original image. So uh, the contrastive explanation basically uh, consists of two instances, these are PPs and PNs, uh, when they are trying to generate a local explanation. So for example, uh, this is a, a handwritten digit classification, right, so if you ask a machine, like, why you classify this image as a three, then this uh, uh, contrastive explanation will generate two uh, instances, this PP and PN. It will say, oh, because of the cyan parts are um, minimally sufficient to be present to support uh, the prediction. And also because uh, the purple part is absent, right? So if we add purple part uh, to the image, it will be classified as a five instead of a three. So these this, uh, bars, uh, the absence of this part is critical to 
uh, explain why the uh, instance is uh, being classified as three. So this explanation, you know, along with a lot of user studies, can show to be uh, more intuitive to human compared to a lot of like correlation-based explanation like LRP or line. Like basically look at look at the heat map to decide which part is more important to support the decision. But they don't actually don't consider which features are missing, right? To uh, to to explain what's happening in terms of the model prediction. Uh, and the connection to uh, adversarial machine learning is uh, actually the adversarial examples, right? So you can think about it as generating PP and PN in just a specific way to generate adversarial examples that will satisfy the meaning of the PP and PN, right? So for example, in PN, we want to generate some minimally sufficient uh, perturbations such that when added to the Im image, it will change the prediction, right? So in many ways, it's just like an adversarial example with some specific constraints. Uh, and we can further generalize this notion to colorful images. Right? So for example, in this case, uh, uh, face recognition with different attributes. And you can see, oh, uh, this, this uh, um, male is being classified as young male and smiling because uh, if you look at these personal negatives, uh, it, uh, it will be classified as old. Uh, and it's a female, right? You, you can see um, when, when it is being classified as when, when the personal negative is being classified as old, old, it will add some wrinkles to uh, the, the image. And for pertinent positives, we can look at the, the super pixels of the given image and specify uh, a minimum amount of uh, uh, super pixels that are minimally sufficient to be present to support the original prediction of the model. Uh, so, but these techniques are basically just a simple modification of the uh, adversarial attack objectives uh, to, to generate some uh, explainable perturbations to, to human. Um, the next example will be model watermarking and fingerprinting. So this is, this is becoming more and more important. And I would like to uh, do a quick recap to this uh, black box attack and we call the zoo attack, right? So. Uh, when I first entered this field, right, a lot of white box attack, I only considering white box setting or transfer setting where you generate a diversal example from one model to attack a black box and other black box model, but you actually uh, suffer from some attack transferability loss. Uh, but the mathematically, if you think about uh, finding uh, uh, perturbations uh, to find a diversal example as an optimization problem, then the perturbation will be your design variable. And whatever image you perturb, you can feed that image to the black box model and observe the outcome of the prediction. And we can actually use that uh, uh, outcome to, to help us guide the next generation of the, the, the perturbation. And that uh, process can actually be done through a very principled way called the zero sort of optimization. So the idea is that in the white box setting, uh, we all we need is to do back propagation to uh, inform the generation of the uh, perturbation. But in a black box setting, we don't have that luxury of doing back propagation, but we do have the luxury of uh, observing the model's prediction based on any given perturbed input. So what we can simply do is to do something very similar to the slope estimation, right? So if we, I want to estimate the slope of the loss function uh, at a particular point, all I need to do is to perturb that point a little bit, right? plus and minus a beta divided by two beta. And then I can figure out the slope, uh, in this case, the gradients of that particular dimension. And once I have the estimated gradients, right, I can do any gradient descent based algorithms using the estimated gradient to help me find the adversarial examples. And that actually constitutes this uh, zero order optimization attack. Um, so how, how would this relate to model watermarking and, and embedding? Um, so this is actually pretty interesting uh, in the case that uh, uh, a lot of times, like the GPT-2 examples, we, we spend so many efforts uh, to develop such a, a high performance model. But uh, we also want to make sure that the model ownership can be protected and it cannot be easily stolen by others. And if the model is being stolen, we are able to verify the ownership of that model. So in many cases, we would like to embed some model watermark to the model we are deploying. And uh, when we are trying to verify the ownership, uh, we would like to make sure uh, 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 the, the, the model that we are verifying can be, uh, can, can be verified in the most practical way. That means uh, only a limited access uh, to, the, to some service that are suspicious of uh, uh, model stealing, and then we want to do verification. So uh, this remote access, and, and most of the time, black box access to this uh, 
a verified model is necessary. Um, so the proposal here is actually to uh, embed uh, an unfit vector. Uh, it could be think of it as some uh, some watermarks uh, to to uh, in the input input gradients of of this trend model. And uh, when we do this remote uh, verification, you can actually use this uh, black box uh, a gradient estimation technique to estimate a gradient and use the estimated gradient uh, to check whether the, the embedded watermark. Uh, and also uh, to perform a, a model verification. Um, in, so in our paper, we actually showed uh, several properties that we believe an ideal watermarking technique uh, should have uh, for a deep learning model, right? including uh, loyalty, robustness, reliability, and efficiency, and so on. Um, so, and we actually designed a very uh, reliable uh, uh, watermarking algorithm called gradient science algorithms. So it, it will first generate an unfit vector, right? That, that will be your uh, watermark. Uh, and, and we then select a, a, a set of uh, input uh, dimensions to carry that watermark, to embed that watermark in the input gradients. Uh, and we can, and we will then generate some embedding key that can help you extract the watermark and to compare that model is actually yours or not. Uh, and then we can select a, a random target class to embed the gradient uh, the, to embed the uh, um, watermark vector into the a gradient of a specific class. So when you do verification, so you can use that to train your uh, uh, model with the watermark. So when we are doing remote verification, we can then take uh, this uh, gradient um, estimation procedure to estimate a gradient on the, uh, on the set C that the watermark is embedded and then you can apply your uh, embedding key function to extract uh, the watermark back vector and compare uh, whether that model is yours or not. Um, so in many cases, we have sh we have shown that such a, a watermarking procedure will have minimum uh, effect uh, in terms of the standard accuracy, uh, but also uh, the watermark is pretty robust uh, against the different the manipulations such as the model quantification. So even if the uh, the the the, the, the thieves uh, uh, steals our model and quanti quantize our model, we, we, are able to, we are still able to verify the ownership of that model. Um, so mother, model fingerprinting is a similar idea, but we, we would like to make sure the, uh, the, the derivatives of the model uh, can still be verified to claim our ownership. Um, so to... Um, show this model fingerprinting, we actually borrow the idea from adversarial examples, right? So in this case, we are not trying to generate examples that deceive the model prediction. In other ways, we would like to generate some specific features that are unique to the model that we are going to uh, verify. And we would like to make sure that the examples are high robust in the sense that um, when the models are undergoing some changes, for example, uh, pruning uh, and, and so on, the the derivatives or the features of that model will, uh, will still remain. And also uh, for utility, the, the, these uh, features should have low transferability. Basically, the features should be unique to the model that is, it is generated from, and it should not be transferable uh, to other uh, like models that are irrelevant to the, to, to the model we are going to verify, so that we, don't, we will not have uh, uh, falsely claim other models to be ours. So to do that, we actually apply some uh, techniques to, to start from a random, randomly initialized uh, uh, data sample and then uh, going through some uh, discrete Fourier transforms and do some low pass filtering to ensure, uh, to ensure this high robustness. Uh, basically, low frequencies are more related to the architecture itself rather than generalized and wouldn't be generalizable to other uh, models. Uh, and then we uh, add some uh, noise injections to the model weights to, so that the, the, uh, these examples will be robust uh, to changes happening at a, at a weight level. Uh, and then we will try to do some gradient descent to make sure uh, these examples uh, will, will have very small loss uh, uh, for, for the, the, the original model we are going to uh, verify. Uh, that basically means these are like very confident uh, examples identified by the original model. So, and, and we can generate a set of such uh, uh, characteristic examples as uh, some model printing function to verify uh, whether uh, a certain model is, 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 is developed by yours or not. 
And to compare the performance, right, we can actually check the robustness. That means how many uh, samples still remain the same prediction on the model you are verifying, uh, minus like how many samples are being misclassified or be being transferred to other models. So these are kind of like the misclassification error, and this is like the correct classification error. So the larger the score means the uh, we can find a, a, a better set of unique uh, features uh, tied to the model. So the examples we are having here is we generate these uh, characteristic examples from this BGG16 model. And then we compare how many samples will also be, uh, mis uh, be identified by BGG19, which is the most similar model, but it's actually a different uh, model. So we would like to make sure the samples that we are creating will not transfer to BGG19 as much as possible. Uh, then we take the BGG16 model and do some pruning, right? And then you can see, and ideally we'd like to hope that after pruning, the set of characteristic examples can still be recognizable um, uh, on, on the pruned model so that we can claim, although you, you steal my model and prune my model, that model's ownership is still belong to uh, the original developer. So uh, you can, what we can observe is that with this notion of a robust uh, adversarial example designed to have a high robustness and low transferability, uh, we, can, we can have a very good model uh, fingerprinting technique uh, by generating these uh, high fidelity examples. Um, let me go through the next question, uh, next application, and then we, I can start for a question if any. So the next application will be you know, data cloaking for privacy and data security. So this is, uh, uh, and there are many applications like that. And I think this is a very promising direction as well. So the idea is that we can generate you know, uh, perturbations not only for you know, trying to evade the model prediction, but actually you can, we can repurpose the perturbation right, to help better protect our data privacy or data security. So in this example, uh, the, the authors actually try to add some perturbations that are really imperceptible, but it can help improve the, the personal privacy uh, of these uh, facial recognition systems. And on the right, uh, we can show by adding some uh, specific uh, perturbed data to the training data, right? So uh, when, when, this, uh, when, when you are su suspicious about whether a model is using your, your own data to do training or not, you can actually uh, use this technique to verify whether a specific model is using your data or not. So it's kind of a membership inference uh, in, in that sense, but uh, for for like uh, for protecting this uh, data uh, privacy and security, and I also learned from Twitter like uh, people are actively using these adversarial perturbation ideas to mitigate or to counter uh, deep fake uh, 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 threats or disinformation attacks. So they are certainly uh, more and more uh, research and focus uh, and works on how can we leverage these adversarial perturbations uh, to uh, protect our systems. Um, any question before I move to the next one? Okay. Yeah, so the next application is uh, data augmentation for improving model generalization. Uh, and, and then again, I want to do a recap, right? Like, so uh, many of us already know uh, there is a trade off between standard accuracy and robustness in many cases. So one experiment we did in the past is we take uh, 18 different uh, image net pre trained models and uh, we rank their uh, top one accuracy, that will be the X axis. And these different dots are different models with different sizes. And on, on the other hand, on the Y axis, we actually rank the uh, sensitivity in terms of uh, how many perturbations are required to make those models change prediction in average. So what we do observe is a very unsatisfying uh, trend, like more accurate model in terms of standard accuracy. On the other hand, it's also more sensitive, right? less robust to these adversarial uh, perturbations. And that, so there is like a known uh, trade-off uh, between robustness and uh, accuracy. Uh, but the, the next interesting thing is, uh, are we able to uh, use these adversarial examples as a way of doing data augmentation to uh, retrain and improve the model performance? Uh, and the answer is yes, but under the assumption that we are using the right uh, adversarial examples. And, and usually what we are describing those as unmanifold examples that are related to generalization errors. Um, so in our recent paper, it's actually being uh, 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 
published at the Triple AI this year, uh, we are showing some adversarial examples for unsupervised machine learning tasks. Um, so the and and to to do that, we we first need to define what does it mean to have be an adversarial example in a unsupervised uh, notion, right? So in a supervised uh, uh, notion, I think adversarial examples are pretty well defined. These are uh, samples that are similar to a given sample, but uh, a supervised model will give a different prediction than uh, than that of the original sample. Uh, but for unsupervised uh, uh, tasks, uh, we are uh, defining uh, this uh, adversarial example in a different notion, right? So in our case, we would like to find some adversarial examples that are less similar, right? They, it's actually dissimilar to uh, X, uh, the, a, a given sample, but uh, the models uh, um, unsupervised loss in terms of the uh, the adversarial example relative to X is actually smaller than the X to the, the original model itself. That means uh, th this adversarial example in an unsupervised setting is some uh, some unseen but overconfident data sample for the unsupervised model. Um, so with this definition, uh, we, how can we find this uh, less least similar adversarial example with with this uh, satisfying this uh, uh, confidence constraint, right? So we can mathematically formulate as an optimization problem by finding a perturbation to X, uh, a given data sample, uh, by minimizing the mutual information between X and the perturbed sample. And this mutual information can be evaluated using this uh, uh, neural, uh, neural mutual information estimator. Uh, there are also, we can add some constraints in terms of making sure the perturbed sample still lies in the uh, uh, available data range and delta can be bounded by uh, plus or minus epsilon and so on. And also the other constraint that we want to make sure uh, the loss of the perturbed sample uh, is uh, no greater than the loss of the X. That means we are finding some perturbed sample that are being overly confident uh, to the uh, supervised model. Uh, and this uh, uh, formulation can be efficiently solved by some min-max uh, algorithms that we are, pro uh, we are proposing in our uh, uh, paper. So you know, feel free to stop by our poster if you're interested in this work. Uh, so with this in mind, right? So we we can actually uh, generate uh, from a model with a set of these unsupervised adversarial examples using this mutual mutual information neural estimator, and retrain the model with this augmented data. And what we are really excited about is we see a consistent uh, uh, improvement across different unsupervised uh, uh, machine learning tasks, right? So for example, data reconstruction using using autoencoder, right? So when we uh, this this is the the column without using our augmentation. And this is the column with uh, using our augmentation. So we do see a uh, significant improvement in terms of the reconstruction error. And this uh, adversarial data augmentation can also uh, be uh, can also complement existing uh, popular rotate like data augmentation tools in terms of flipping and rotation and Gaussian noise. That means this adversarial um, data augmentation actually find a, a unique set of uh, unmanifold samples that are basically beneficial for data augmentation and can improve the original model's uh, task. Uh, similarly, when we try to apply this technique to SimClear, uh, we do observe a, a significant uh, accuracy improvement uh, to, to improve uh, contrastive learning. Okay, so any question? The next application is uh, called semantic shift detection. Um, so this is a, a paper that we published at the AAAI last year. And also we did a demo uh, accepted to AAAI this year. So what is a, a, a semantic shift? So the idea is, are we able to, looking at the two sets of embeddings, right? A uh, trend on different corpora, are we able to detect some shifted meanings of a given word? Uh, and this is basically a, a, a unsupervised uh, a detection problem. And we already know those uh, uh, word shifts can happen across domains or time, right? So for example, the word space can be used differently in AI and physics or you know, biscuit or surgery have a different meanings in terms of UK versus US English. Or, and, or some words can add new meanings uh, over time. So for example, Apple uh, before uh, 2020, 2000, uh, means the fruit rather than some tech company or uh, this this uh, word bit right is uh, uh, have a different meaning you know pre or after the computer uh, era 
so what so how do we find those the semantic shifts right if, if, if we are given two set of embeddings a and b trend are separately on two different corpus uh, so the idea is that we if we want to detect changes right the best way is to simulate changes uh, in, by ourselves and then train a, a classifier to detect and, and, and be, be aware of the changes that we simulate so it it is in a way similar to self-supervised uh, perturbation. We self-generated some perturbations, and then we train a classifier to class uh, to uh, be able to identify those uh, uh, simulated changes. So that when we uh, uh, apply this technique on a real uh, unsupervised uh, task, we are able to identify shifty words after aligning the uh, embeddings uh, of uh, aligning these uh, two embedding sets. Um, so we apply this uh, method to several real world that has in this case UK versus US English uh, with some ground truth. So you can see the detection rate and the, the F1 scores is much higher uh, compared to uh, standard methods. Uh, we can also uh, uh, actually find semantic shifts uh, by looking at the different languages, you know, evolve over time, uh, English, German and Latin and so on. So uh, across the board, we, we get a very high accuracy, you know, compared to uh, naive uh, uh, this uh, uh, embedding alignment method. Uh, we also have this interactive demo called the Sense uh, being presented at AAA, and there's a live demo with this uh, address available. So feel free to check it out. Uh, the last application I want to cover is called the robust uh, text captures. So um, robust text captures, uh, I, I'm sure many of you already know, or uh, you like it or didn't like it. Uh, so much, but uh, um, it, it was originally helped to um, prevent these uh, machine, 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 uh, purely machine users, and, uh, mm -hmm. and also pre pre prevent these uh, malicious uh, uh, frequent queries and so on. Um, but most of the time, because of the machines are being uh, improved, right? We we are actually making our captures more and more complicated and to a level that even hu humans cannot easily re recognizable. It actually hurts the utility. So in our recent work, we are actually thinking, are we able to use the idea of adversarial examples to generate a, a, a good uh, text capture for a human in the sense that uh, these, uh, these are uh, text, robust text, text captures that will deceive machines. So any machine-based uh, uh, text capture solvers were not able to identify the, the, the digits correctly. But humans can have an easier time to uh, recognize those digits. So that's the goal. So you can see like uh, these are some traditional captures. They are becoming more and more complicated uh, because uh, to, because uh, if they be made, are made too easy, they will be re uh, easily recognizable by uh, machine-based uh, solvers. Uh, and this is the set of examples generated by our robust text capture. So we basically generate both a front uh, front uh, font uh, uh, in addition to these background uh, colors uh, to make it them more diverse and to confuse uh, machines but also are maximally uh, readable and recognizable to human um, so when we are evaluated uh, in terms of different length of the text capture over, over across the board we get a very uh, low uh, recognition rate by machines. And also we did some uh, user study to show humans are still recognize, can, can still recognize our uh, robust text captures. And even if we consider this uh, adaptive setting where we assume some of the our generated text captures are being uh, manually labeled and retrained by the machine learning solvers, we are able to generate a new set of uh, diverse and new text captures that will not be recognizable uh, by these uh, uh, um, machine solvers augmented with some manually labeled data. So in a way, this is very robust and practical uh, to use. And this is a very uh, exciting application that uh, we get inspiration from its adversarial examples. Okay, so the last application I want to cover is uh, scientific discovery. So this is also a very um, exciting field. And again, uh, we draw a lot of exploration from um, black box adversarial attacks, right? So the, the original task is this. So we are given a molecule uh, and we would like to use some property evaluations as a guidance to help us find a better and optimized molecules with uh, some, some uh, um, preferred properties, but still satisfying some uh, design constraints. 
So one concrete example is uh, uh, related to uh, uh, COVID research, right? So we we can take uh, uh, several existing uh, uh, inhibitor molecules, that, but we also know these inhibitor molecules are do, do not bind well to the SARS-CoV-2 main proteins. So we will certainly want to uh, optimize those uh, um, existing inhibitor molecules to uh, have a higher binding affinity to the uh, main SARS-CoV-2 uh, proteins while assuring the, uh, the optimized molecules still have uh, some similarity to the original molecule so that we, can, we know how to uh, synthesize the, uh, these uh, new optimized, uh, newly generated molecules uh, more easily uh, based on uh, like prior knowledge. So, uh, so we can easily uh, uh, create an end-to-end -end, you know, query-based framework to enable such a, a guided search, right? So the idea is we can first uh, take a pre-trained encoder-decoder that is responsible to map a molecule into an embedding vector and then we'll uh, decode to take that embedding vector to uh, reconstruct into the molecule sequence. Um, so we basically play with the embedding vector using this uh, 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 zeroes order optimization techniques, right? So given an uh, embedding vector from the original input, uh, we will search the neighboring space using uh, this uh, gradient-based uh, optimization uh, to find the next candidate. And when we find the next candidate in the embedding space, uh, it will be decoded by the decoder to uh, obtain the, uh, the, the uh, the new structure and then it will be passed to a set of uh, property evaluations. In this case, uh, checking the similarity to the original uh, molecule as well as checking the binding affinity uh, to the uh, main, um, uh, to the SARS-CoV-2 main proteins. Um, so we and then we will know how uh, we, and we can design a loss function to know how well this uh, new candidate uh, is uh, doing, uh, um, and and basically use that the. Uh, um, uh, lost as a feedback to guide the next generation of the search in the latent space. So in many ways, it's like uh, how can we find an adversarial example with certain uh, design uh, properties and constraints uh, through a black box uh, um, or, or a set of a black box property evaluations. Um, so uh, so we actually, we actually tested on several tasks, and here are like two of them. So one is this drug likeness uh, maximization task with some uh, uh, Tanimoto similarity constraint, like the, the optimized sequence has to be similar to uh, the original sequence by a 0.4 major by the Tanimoto similarity. Uh, given that constraint, we can show uh, on a, on a, uh, compared to other methods, we can uh, achieve a much higher success rate in terms of uh, optimizing the same set of uh, molecules uh, to uh, to uh, uh, to uh, improve the, their dropness from low to high. Uh, and similarly, another task related to synthetic accessibility is called a, a penalized log p score. So in this case, uh, we again have this uh, similarity constraint. We would like to uh, find optimized the molecules under that constraint to maximize that score. Uh, so in this case, we also show that this uh, um, QMO, right? this uh, query-based molecule optimization, can really find you a, a set of optimized molecules which are much better uh, penalized log p scores. Um, so, uh, but the design principle and also the, the objective uh, is actually very similar to how uh, we design adversarial examples with some specific constraints and, and also some uh, objectives that we would like these adversarial examples to achieve. Okay, so finally, I will uh, go to the concluding remarks and discussion. Um, so I hope I have convinced you that there's a lot of interesting things and important things that we should do and think deeply about uh, in terms of the sustainable research for adversarial machine learning. Right? So I will really de uh, describe adversarial machine learning as a, as a whole iceberg here. Right? But, so what we are uh, doing so far and the, the current focus is really only the tip of the iceberg, right? the attack, defense, verification. They are just tip of the iceberg. There's a lot of uh, bulk of main body hidden under the water, and and they could be this adversarial machine learning for good, right? Because as I mentioned earlier, through this uh, um, this uh, um, kind of reverse engineering or some a lot of studies on understanding how to attack or defend or certify a, a machine learning model, especially complicated neural networks, we actually implicitly learn. Uh, how can we uh, control or manipulate the behavior or the uh, decision-making uh, process of the machine learning model? So with that technique in mind, right, so it, it should be 
not difficult for us to repurpose or reuse that technique uh, to do something for good uh, uh, to benefit the, the mainstream machine learning research or to uh, explore other uh, possibilities and applications. So I certainly believe uh, adversarial machine learning for good is uh, will be a sustainable research in adversarial machine learning and really it's beyond the focus of attacks and defenses. Uh, and specifically, I'm, I'm personally very optimistic about its model reprogramming. As I mentioned, it's a powerful way to reuse uh, a, a pre-trained model from a domain to solve uh, challenging and emerging problems in different domains. Uh, and it can really uh, unleash the power uh, of a large pre-trained models and make them more generally accessible to um, different model developers. Um, on the other hand, I also uh, looking forward to new applications inspired by adversarial machine learning and hope um, my slides and tutorial actually give you some ideas of how uh, to tackle these uh, uh, problems you have at hand through the uh, technology or techniques in adversarial machine learning. Um, and finally, you know, if you're interested in this uh, research related to adversarial machine learning, you know, feel free to follow me on Twitter. Um, and I'm also very open to uh, research collaborations uh, and, and open discussions. Uh, with that, I will end my tutorial and open the floor for questions. Uh, so feel free to unmute yourself. Uh, yeah, okay, yeah, so I see a question. Yeah, so are the slides available somewhere? Yes, so there is a website. Uh, uh, you, you can click the link through the Triple AI uh, tutorial forum. There is a website or you can Google adversarial machine learning for good. I created a Google website and all the slides will be made available there. Other questions, comments yeah. or discussion? Yeah, yeah uh, Hi, uh, this is Bing Ying yeah, from Clemson University. Uh, so first of all, uh, I really appreciate you give a, a, such a great talk. Um, and I have two questions about the uh, I have two questions. So for, the first question is that you mentioned that it is a not it is not not a wise decision to publish defense paper uh, uh, for the virtual example in 2022. So I'm wondering uh, what's your side about publishing paper uh, publishing defense paper uh, against, uh, for example, poison attacks and uh, uh, maybe uh, backdoor attacks. Uh, what, what, what's your opinion? Yeah, no, no, so I, I, I would like to correct. So I, I didn't mean to mean we, we shouldn't publish defense papers in, in 2022. What I mean is it literally is a very high bar, right? In terms of uh, why we expect a, a, a defense paper to be accepted uh, to a conference, right? So uh, you, you, you really, if you are in looking in, if you are working on defense, I think this is certainly an important topic, but you need to go through, literally go through the checklist that I have provided. Uh, where is it? I'm inside to find it. Right, right, right. Uh, so, uh, yeah, yeah, so- You, you, you uh, really go through the checklist to ensure your reviewer is okay with it and you know, to publish your defense, right? But you can see there's a lot of uh, obstacles and check marks you need to do. But if you can find a method that actually, you know, uh, I actually check smarts all the points, then I, I, would, I would certainly think it is, this will be a very like milestone uh, type of paper. But it's like uh, what I'm saying is that like, there is a very high bar to reach, and there are so many people working on that. It's a crowded area, uh, and, and there are like and there are some believe like there is no free lunch in the sense that when you add a defense, uh, how practical that defense is, and how harmful you will bring to the original system. That's kind of a uh, always the, the issue people are, are, are discussing. And, and unless, unless we can show there is no such a barrier, then I, I don't think the defense paper will, will make a, a big progress easily. That, that's my view. But I certainly don't, don't want to discourage people working on defenses. OK, OK, thank you. Uh, and the second question is, uh, uh, can you ex explain one more, one more time about the connection between the uh, model, uh, model reprogramming and uh, the backdoor attack? Uh, yeah. Yes, yes. So, uh, yeah, so, so you, you, don't, you don't need to buy my explanation if, you, if that doesn't make sense to you. So, but, but what, what the connection I want to make is, uh, where is this? Yeah, so the connection I want to make is, you know, backdoor, backdoor attacks. I actually try to insert some uh, triggers and such that uh, when you train on this poison data, your model will, will secretly learn in, uh, in other function other than the original head written classification tasks, right? So I was trying to make the uh, analogy here by saying, okay, 
if you have a pre-trained model, right? And then if we can design some uh, uh, learnable trigger pattern at the, that, at the inputs, right? Basically, if you think about the, if you think about this uh, uh, trainable input here, right? So when, when we design this uh, trainable input, right? It, it is actually a universal perturbation to uh, the target data, right? So these this noisy friends are, are actually the trend parameters that will be appended to every target data and sent to the pre-trained model for inference. So in that case, you can think about this uh, uh, trainable input as some sort of uh, trigger pattern, right? That will uh, basically, the, the, effect, the, the effect of that trigger pattern will basically uh, uh, change the representations of the target data uh, in, the, in the latent space of the pre-trained model to align the representations of the target source label. So in that way, I, I was saying uh, we can actually think about it as a uh, backdooring that model, but we threw these uh, um, uh, reprogram layers to enable this uh, representation alignment change. Okay, gotcha, gotcha. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Sure. Thank you. That's a great question. Thank you. Oh yeah, thank, and thank you for Basal for uh, putting the web, uh, the web link. Yeah, you can find the, the slides there. Um, any other questions or comments? Yeah, so if you have any like other thoughts or you want to have any other discussion, you know, feel free to find me uh, through email or so. Um, uh, yeah, and I'm looking forward to have more discussion with you and hope this uh, tutorial uh, will be uh, useful for your uh, research and study. Oh, I do see a question from Justin. Uh, Trainable border is the same across all new target domain images. Yes. Yes, yes. So, so this uh, trainable border or this trainable frame is actually a universal to every target data. Just, just like a similarly, like how backdoor is working, you have the same trigger pattern applied to any input, and then it will basically make the uh, uh, model to do a specific action that is uh, being uh, poisoned to do so. So in this way, we are actually uh, training some um, trigger pattern to trigger the reprogramming function of the model to do to solve a specific task. Any questions or comments? Uh, so I, I may not be able to see people raising hands, but uh, you know, so it's better to you know just unmute yourself or. Uh, or, or type in a Q and A. I, I know it's a it's a relatively small room, so we don't need to raise hands. It's hard for me to find who are raising hands or not. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Laura. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so if not, if there are no further questions, I think I can give uh, back uh, eight minutes to everyone. And yeah, uh, have a nice day and enjoy your AAA. Thank you.